Hello and welcome to European Autocraft Studios 944 Turbo Restoration Project. We have 1,000 subscribers now. It's actually 1,002. Thank you to Toby Cirrus for kicking us over to the four digits. Uh, really cool. Very excited about that. We can uh, monetize now and all those crappy ads that you have to watch. Now we're going to get a little piece of it uh, once all this settles down. So we're excited about it because we would rather do this than do work every day for everyday customers. But they're good people. Uh, a couple points to make here, uh, being our special extravaganza, we have air conditioning. Uh, finally, we got that old unit hooked up we've been talking about for years. It's working great. So instead of feeling like we're working in Mount St. Helens volcano, we are uh, cool and crisp in the Arctic frozen tundra. So that's a good sign. Uh, what I want to do today, being our thousand subscriber extravaganza is show you how um, this transmission actually works uh, I mean you can take it apart put them together all day long but sometimes you just don't know what really is going on inside of here so we took our underground train system over to complex B which is our fabrication department wood section uh, and talked to the engineers over there to help us come up with a design that can demonstrate this open and outside of the uh, outside of the case and everything. Uh, so that's what they came up with. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So, so let's start by showing you some things here. This, one thing to, uh, that, that makes this sort of complicated is when it's all inside the case, uh, you really can't see what's going on and it just looks like a mess and a lot of stuff. But when you break it down and take out the, the, the simple elements of it, we have uh, our input shaft. The torque tube connects directly to this from the engine and just rotates it. With the engine running, this is, this is all it does when you're in neutral. Um, this won't move because this is attached to the wheels via the, uh, the, the ring gear. This is why we call it a ring and pinion. Uh, this uses a 12 millimeter offset. Uh, this gear isn't directly right dead center. It's actually off-center by 12 millimeters and uh, I think they do that for strength uh, and quiet operation that part I don't know but it is a 12 millimeter offset and then there's a certain depth that this is sunken into the ring gear uh, and that, that'll all be covered with the ring and pinion setup so what really is going on these are the four speeds um, fifth speed is here this is in the back of the case. I really can't demonstrate that because of our amazing engineering department made this beautiful wood structure for us. And I can't connect it, but that's okay. Um, looking at uh, these gears, if you can identify what's what, you know, uh, even non-engineers know a little bit about physics. So we know that if you turn a small gear uh, and connect it to a larger gear, the larger gear is gonna turn very small. I don't know the gear ratios exactly of this one. I probably should have looked them up. Uh, you can look them up in your service manual for that. Uh, but you can see how many revolutions this is making compared to this big gear. Now, right now, the pinion gear is not moving because we haven't selected first gear yet. These are on, uh, on bearings. Uh, these are fixed, uh, fixed here on this shaft, but these two are not. Uh, we'll show you how that works. So when we select first gear, we have um, these forks uh, connect to the rods and, and our, our shifter lever will just slide these back and forth. We'll get into the shifter another time. There's, you're driving along and you've got this lever in your car and you're just flopping it all over the place and the car moves. Why? Uh, well, that's all one massive support system just to make these things work. And it's very simple. Here's our first gear. Now, all we did here was connect this gear to the shaft. That's it. We just had to somehow make this not be floating anymore. So now that this is fully engaged through the synchro system and the dog teeth that attach it, you can see the teeth here, those are part of the gear. This hub is part of the shaft. We connected the hub through the synchro, which slows down the gear so you don't grind. Um, and then just lock it onto the gear. So now we have a complete rotating assembly. This is now one piece. Um, 
pretty simple, really, when you look at it. It looks complicated because of the, the mechanics of it, the engineering of it. Whoever designed this kind of thing not only had to design the gears, how they mesh, how they engage. You have to design a case that makes it all work and then a shifter that makes it all shift. It's just engineering, just amazing, absolutely amazing stuff. So there's our first gear. You can see how many times I'm rotating the shaft just to make this go. So our first gear is relatively low. Um, we're revving the engine like crazy, but we're hardly going anywhere. Um, and that's great for torque. We're using the engine's torque to start moving the car. So now we're in first gear. We move the lever down to second gear. We have uh, a slightly larger gear driving uh, another gear. It's smaller than first, but... Again, it's all science, it's all the ratios in physics. So uh, the ratio for this, this gear, again, it can be found in your, your service manual. Now we're moving a little bit faster. Um, that's pretty simple stuff. But if we engage third gear, now remember all those detents I showed you, that's to prevent you from doing this. And what do we have now? It just locks up. So those detent system that we saw, all of these here, uh, when I showed you the, the, I don't know where my third gear shaft is, but the third gear shaft, there it is here, um, that had the pin inside of it. All these, all these little safety measures are to prevent you from getting it in two gears at once. So, let's take it out of second, uh, and now we're in third gear. We're moving a little bit faster. You can see our pinion shaft is really happy there. Um, Simple. And then from third right into fourth. And now we have a one-to-one -one ratio. It should be one-to-one. -one. Most, most fourth gears on a five-speed would be one-to-one. -one. Um, some transmission have two slight overdrives. Uh, five would be a, a minor overdrive, and then six would be a major overdrive. I don't think it was that complex back uh, in the 80s when this, this was designed. So... What else is going on here? Uh, well, we need reverse. Where's reverse, right? Uh, we have fifth gear here, which is on the back. You can see all our, uh, our other gears are small, driving larger. Then when we get to fourth, these gears are just about the same size or exactly the same size. I do believe it's one-to-one. -one. So the amount of teeth here would be the same, and you have whatever re engine revolution is the same as the pinion revolution. And then the final gear ratio on this gear, I think we figured out was eight. What did I say that was? Um, this is eight twenty-seven. Eight twenty-seven. Eight eight revolutions to twenty-seven revolutions. Something like that. So we have fifth gear is a slight overdrive. This one is now turning this one. Uh, a little bit faster in fifth gear, but once you have the momentum and the speed, uh, you can you can do that. So, how does reverse work? Well, um, Anthony has been in Sweden for the past month. He's back just to help us out on a 1,000 subscriber. What is it? Extravaganza. All right. Because I have to rotate this, uh, the pinion shaft's going to rotate in the other direction. This doesn't really want to stay up too well. We're going to go talk to the guys down at Complex B and show them how they kind of really messed up my demonstration here, but that's okay. Complex B is it's a big place. It's uh, have to take a train to get there. So reverse is simple. We have um, all these. All these are, if we connect them, you know, we've got they all turn in the same direction. Some transmissions that have a lay shaft, uh, it works a little bit differently, but this is pretty much the same type of system you find in any manual transmission. The F1 transmissions, the Ferrari transmissions, Maserati, they use a paddle shifter. It's really a manual transmission that's shifted by a computer uh, in a very rapid, uh, rapid action on the clutch. So even that, even the F1 transmissions have this. But here's our reverse gear. Uh, we, it has slight synchronization. It's only done by a spring, uh, where these are actually forced by the, the shifter, the shifter fork. So this will sit out here. We're still in neutral, yes. This will sit here. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. 
This just sits over here not doing anything, uh, not engaged with anything. When you select reverse, which is on the, the reverse gear, fifth gear gate, this slides in and it just kind of just kind of sits there between the two gears and now you can see our pinion shaft is turning in the opposite direction. And then you come out of reverse, this comes back over here. It's actually up out of the way a little bit. It, it's just close, but it doesn't touch. And that's our, uh, that's how that works. You know, actually it goes this way. <laughs> I was wondering why it was so close. It actually is on this side over here. So it sits out of the way and it's engaged in this direction, but it does the same function. The shaft is probably, I don't want to get in the way of the camera. I'm trying to show you like that. And then this will slide back out of the way and it doesn't do anything. So there's that and the synchronizer is on a spring which sits uh, on the shaft here and then when you engage it is when it's it touches. And this slows the gear down so it doesn't grind so much. Um, but this, the synchro stays engaged and it slips on that synchro. That's why if you drive in reverse for a long distance, it's going to burn out the synchro. So don't do that. So that's pretty much how that works. Now you notice too, reverse gear, these are straight cut gears. That's why you get this horrible whining in reverse. And pretty much all cars are, uh, are this way. The reverse gear is straight cut. I imagine it's because it's easier to engage a straight cut gear in this fashion to, to link the two shafts together, where all these other gears are called helical. Um, very quiet gears, the way the power is transmitted through the gear, it's very quiet. Um, and that's pretty much how that works. The ring gear, um, I don't know why our oil pump sprocket is uh, so loose. We're going to look into that. Something else we noticed on this transmission, if you look close at the first gear input shaft teeth, you can see how pitted those are. Um, that's just fat metal fatigue. Um, I've only seen that once in a while, but this input shaft is now pretty much useless. Uh, I know uh, the owner really doesn't have the money to put this together properly. I think we're going to continue using this uh, to demonstrate how we do it. We're going to um, disassemble the pinion shaft. We're going to check all the, the gaps. Uh, if you look at some of these uh, teeth here, you can see margins um, where the teeth... I'm going to find them now. Well, you can see here where, where there's no contact of, of this gear and there's no contact on the very end. You can see a little shadow uh, of a margin. So that's that mesh is good. Um, I see some that overlap a little bit um, that we're going to look into and see maybe you know, maybe we have a shim that's uh, or a snap ring that's not the right thickness. But we'll do all that measuring uh, as we assemble it and see see if we have any other flaws on this. I don't know if anybody's repairing these, if they can be welded up and remachined. Uh, I had planned on putting this back together, uh, adjusting whatever we need, put a new gasket set in it, and do some measuring. But uh, I, I'll probably still do that. But I don't want to uh, put this all together with all new parts and, um, and not be able to replace this input shaft or get it repaired. So this is an issue. It probably drove fine like this. I don't know how much longer it would last. Uh, if we replace the input shaft, we also have to replace the first gear, uh, second gear, and third gear because, uh, no, just first and second. We have to replace the first, first and second gears as well because they're matched to the uh, input shaft. So if we replace this, we have to get the set that goes with it if we get a used one. Or um, if we get a new set, we have to buy a new set of gears and then shim them all up. Since we're not replacing pinion bearings, this pinion bearing here is over $500 on uh, pretty much any way you look, between $450 and $500. It looks good, but we'll inspect everything really close, so we're probably not going to be replacing the bearings. If we do replace the bearings, like I said before, we have to put this back in the case and measure how deep this pinion is um, 
how deep it's in the case. So to do that, we use a 385 bar. Uh, in the dealership level, in the, um, the, the all the shops that do manual transmission should have one of these. They're very expensive, hard to come by. Uh, when you buy this set, they're about $3,500. I'm missing parts to this. I just found this on eBay. Um, I saw the picture, and it's, it's rusty. I can clean it all up. It, it's not, not too awful bad. Um, these are the, uh, the parts that go into the bearing. Uh, where's my kicks? Oh, that's the big one. That's the big one. Yeah. But this just happened to come with the right sizes. These go inside the, the case like that. And then this one goes inside here uh, on the bearing race inside, and that gives us a uh, a center point. You can adjust uh, what size the adjustment. You can adjust this out once it's together. You can adjust this out so it's tight, centered, and uh, and gives us that nice uh, nice measuring area. There's a pin that's supposed to be inside of here, a threaded housing with a pin. That will contact the tip of the disc we put on, on top of here. It's a, uh, I forget how many millimeters. But that goes on top here, and that's our measuring, our measuring range. So from the center point uh, of our carrier, that's this, this becomes, you know, the, the, this piece here. So we're measuring from the center of this to the top of the, uh, the pinion head. And that distance is our pinion depth. The deviation R, which is not on this ring gear because this is an original ring gear, um, will not play a factor here because we have to measure it direct before we take it out. We'll put the new bearings in if we were gonna replace bearings, measure it again, take the measurement, subtract it from what we had, and then uh, shim it accordingly. A lot of times the bearings are exactly the same. You don't have to do any uh, shimming, but uh, replacing any shims, but there um, there are times that you might have to. A new ring and pinion, definitely, they're never the same. But bearings, eh, it's pretty good. You have to check about nine times out of ten, or, or how many times out of ten? Nine times? Well, let's say it's nine times out of a hundred. Four to five dentists recommend. You, you're not following me. No. That's okay. It's our one thousand subscriber extravaganza. So we can say silly things like that and get away with it. So that's the 385 bar. I'm missing a few more things. When I gather these parts, and they're all very expensive, there's a set of these. I can't get them out. They're kind of stuck. There's a set of these on, uh, that one's stuck. That one's up. On eBay for $500. I can't tell you what I paid for this. It was so, if, if the guy knew what he had, and I wasn't sure. It looked like it. It was all rusty, kind of a crappy picture. So I'm like, I bet that's a 385 bar. So I got it for like a tenth of what this thing is worth because he thought it was another part for a Ford, or a tool for a Ford. I'm like, well, I'll take a chance. For... So I did, and I got myself a 385 bar. Very cool. More parts to come on that. I've got the, there's a magnet. Uh, these are magnets. This is a device that goes on here to measure the, uh, the, the depth here to, to set it to zero. Micrometer goes in this end. This captures the micrometer, so... The, um, when you push on the pin here, the dial uh, on the micrometer deflects to give you the reading. Awesome tool. I'm very excited to have it. Um, yeah, really cool stuff. We have air conditioning. Yes, and more volcano feeling. Um, we have an input shaft I have to look into and see what we're going to do about that. Um, back from Sweden. Thank you for coming back for this amazing extravaganza. 1,000 subscriber, say it, extravaganza. So that's it for this episode. Uh, we want to just at least clear up some of these things and keep in mind all of this other stuff is a support system to make this work, uh, just so you can drive happily in your 944 turbo. Or 944, it's the same. The gear gears are different. The pinion's a lot stronger on the turbo. Um, I, don't, I don't have one from another car, but... Um, you'll see some of the other ones, the uh, 944 normally aspirated one, 
the teeth are, uh, there's more of them, and they're smaller, not as strong to take the torque from the, the uh, turbo. So that's it. Great stuff. Next week, we're going to uh, disassemble the shaft. You'll see what's inside, all the shim snap rings. We'll measure the snap rings. We'll measure, uh, we'll measure everything with micrometers and good stuff like that. You're good with math, right? You'll know how to use a micrometer? Mm. All righty then. We'll see you next week. Thank you for 1,000. Thank you very much. We'll see you uh, with more good stuff to 2,000. 2,000. We're going for 2,000 now. 3,000. 2,000. We'll stick with 2,000. Thank you.